Welcome back everybody to another deep dive. This time we're tackling a topic that's beloved by academics, but investors, not so much. Oh, are we talking about factor investing? You got it. The idea of using company characteristics, stuff like size or value to try and beat the market. Yeah, on paper, it sounds almost too good to be true, right? Like a shortcut to outsized returns. Exactly. I mean, there's tons of research, mountains of data, all suggesting that factors can give you an edge. But that's where things get interesting, because while the academics are crunching numbers, investors out in the wild, well, they're not always seeing those promised results. So that's what we're digging into today. Can you actually beat the market with factors? Or is it all just a statistical mirage? Let's dive in and find out. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. All right, so before we get into the nitty gritty, let's set the stage a bit. Where did this whole factor investing thing even come from? Well, rewind with me back to like the 1960s, 70s. Back then, researchers started noticing something peculiar. Peculiar like how? Well, they observed that smaller companies, those small cap stocks, were often outperforming the big players. Picture David taking down Goliath, but in the stock market. So, like, a size advantage. Smaller companies being more nimble, maybe? Yeah, something like that. And this observation, it became known as the size premium. But it wasn't until the early 90s that it really took off. Ah, the 90s. What happened then? Enter the Fama French three-factor model. Eugene Fama and Kenneth French, these guys were rock stars in the finance world. They argued that stock returns, well, they weren't just random. There were specific factors like size and value that were driving those returns. Okay, so they put some actual framework around this size premium idea. Right. And this model, it basically launched the whole field of factor investing. So I imagine investors were pretty excited about this. I mean, who wouldn't want to unlock a secret code for beating the market? Yeah, you'd think so. But one of our sources highlights a really interesting story about this. Dimensional Fund Advisors, or DFA, they launched a small cap fund in 1981 specifically designed to, you know, capture this size premium. So investors piled in, ready to ride the small cap wave to riches. What happened? Well, here's the twist. For the first 18 years, this fund actually underperformed the S&P 500. Can you imagine? Whoa, 18 years is a long time to be holding on to a losing bet. Tell me about it. And it wasn't just small cap either. Value stocks, another popular factor, they showed a similar pattern outperforming for 14 years, then trailing the market for another 14. It's like a roller coaster you didn't sign up for. Okay, so clearly these factors aren't as predictable as they might seem in theory. So why are academics still so obsessed with them if they can be this unreliable? It's a good question. And to answer it, we got to look at the evidence. So what does the data say? Well, even with these swings, factors do appear to be statistically robust. We're seeing them show up in markets all over the world and across different accounting methods. And on top of that, newer research has actually uncovered a whole factor zoo. It's not just about size and value anymore. A factor zoo. I'm intrigued, but also slightly terrified. Think of it like this. You go to the zoo every day for a year and keep track of which animal is most active, right? You notice that the monkeys, they're usually swinging around the most. But some days the lions are roaring their heads off or the penguins are having a parade, right? It doesn't mean your monkey observation is wrong. It's just that there's this inherent randomness in the zoo, just like in the market. So the monkeys, they're like our reliable factors they usually deliver. But every now and then, something else takes center stage. Exactly. But here's the thing. Most investors... They aren't zookeepers patiently observing for years on end, right? They're trying to pick the winning animal or factor right now. And that's where things get tricky. Because those academic studies, they often use something called long-short portfolios. They buy stocks based on the factor and simultaneously bet against others. So it's like a controlled experiment to isolate the factor's impact. Exactly. But most people don't invest that way, right? And then you've got to factor in trading costs, which those studies often ignore. All those little fees can eat into your returns in the real world. So those picture-perfect results from the research, 
they might not reflect the messy reality of actually being in the market with real money and real emotions on the line. It's the difference between fantasy football and actually putting your money on the game. So we've got this tension, strong evidence for factors in the research, but a much more mixed bag for investors trying to put it into practice. And then to make things even more interesting. We have the anti-factor, the ultimate market contrarian. Okay, you're going to have to explain that one. What in the world is the anti-factor? Imagine you take all the stocks that should be the worst performers, the big expensive companies everyone thinks are going to lag behind. They're the market's tortoises, slow and steady, maybe even falling behind. So these are the companies you'd avoid if you were trying to beat the market. Exactly. But here's where it gets weird. Even these supposed losers can have their moments of glory. Our source paper points out that this anti-factor, it actually beat the market for decades leading up to the 1980s and then again in the 1990s. Wait, so you're telling me the stocks that are supposed to be the worst can sometimes win the race? That throws everything we think we know about stock picking out the window. Right. It really highlights the role of randomness and volatility in the market. Sometimes it's not about some grand economic shift. It's just the market being the market, full of unpredictable twists and turns. So it's not always about being a genius stock picker. Sometimes it's just about being lucky, being in the right place at the right time. Well, there's definitely an element of luck involved. But remember those monkeys at the zoo. Factors, by their nature, aren't perfectly in sync with the overall market, right? They're designed to zig when the market zags, which means they're going to outperform and underperform at different times. Okay, that makes sense. So sometimes those periods of underperformance, they just happen to cluster together, making it feel like you're on a losing streak. Right, but it doesn't necessarily mean the factor itself is broken. It's just the nature of the beast. So maybe it's not always your fault. If you're not seeing those factor premiums, maybe it's just the market throwing you a curveball. So how do we as investors make sense of all this? Because I got to say, it's a little unnerving knowing even those supposedly bad stocks can have their winning streaks. Yeah, it really challenges that idea that there's some secret formula for always picking winners. But that's where things get interesting, right? Because if we zoom out, look at the bigger picture, factor investing can work, but it demands a long term perspective. A lot of patience. More like a marathon than a sprint, really. So, no get-rich-quick schemes here. Factor investing is more of a slow and steady kind of game. Exactly. You got to be mentally prepared for those inevitable periods of underperformance. Remember those 14-year swings we talked about? That's just part of the deal. So, how do we navigate this factor roller coaster? Should we be chasing the factors that are doing well right now? I mean, it's tempting to jump on the bandwagon when something's hot. Ah, that's a classic trap and one you definitely want to avoid. Yeah. Chasing short-term trends, it's like playing musical chairs with your investments. What's hot today could be ice cold tomorrow. Yeah, makes sense. Don't put all your eggs in one basket and all that. Exactly. Diversification, that's key. Mm. Just like you wouldn't put all your savings into a single company, you shouldn't go all in on one factor. Spread your risk across different factors to kind of cushion the blow when one of them inevitably hits a rough patch. Remember, those zoo animals, they take turns being the star of the show. That actually reminds me of something in one of our sources about averages. They were talking about how those long-term impressive factor returns, well, they're averages over like really long periods, but our individual investing timelines, they're much shorter. So what happens if you happen to be investing during a factors down cycle? You've hit on a really important point. What looks great on paper, you know, statistically significant, doesn't always translate into a smooth ride for individual investors. And that's why it's so crucial to not get swept up in the hype surrounding any particular factor. Because remember, the market, it's complex. And those academic averages, they don't tell the whole story. Yeah, I can see how it would be easy to get caught up in the excitement, especially when you see those long-term returns. It's like seeing a winning lottery ticket and thinking, hey, I could do that too. Right. But it's important to remember that those returns, they come with a price, volatility and uncertainty. You got to be okay with the fact that factor investing, it's a long game and there will be bumps along the way. It's all about managing expectations. And speaking of bumps, I'm still kind of stuck on the fact that even the anti factor, those large expensive companies, they outperform the market sometimes. I mean, what does that tell us about predictability in general? Does that mean we should just ditch all our fancy models and strategies. It's definitely a humbling reminder that the market, it's full of surprises. Even with all our fancy tools and data analysis, there's still this element of unpredictability that we just can't fully control. So where do we go from here? 
how do we reconcile this powerful academic research with the sometimes chaotic reality of the market? It's like we're trying to solve a puzzle with missing pieces. Well, I think it starts by recognizing that there's no one size fits all approach. Every investor has different goals, risk tolerance, time horizon, right? What works for one person might be a disaster for someone else. So there's no magic formula, no guaranteed path to those market beating returns. If only. I wish it were that simple. But that doesn't mean factor investing is pointless. It just means you got to go into it with a realistic understanding of its limitations and be prepared to adapt your strategy as the market throws you curveballs. It sounds like factor investing is kind of like surfing. You know, you need to be able to ride the waves, but you also got to know when to paddle back to shore. I love that analogy. It's about finding that balance between riding the momentum of those factors and knowing when to protect yourself from a potential wipeout. And sometimes the best move is just to wait for a better wave. This has been incredibly insightful. I feel like I'm starting to see factor investing in a whole new light, not just as a set of rules, but as a way of thinking about the market. That's exactly it. It's not about blindly following formulas. It's about understanding those underlying forces that are driving market behavior and using that knowledge to make informed decisions. So as we wrap things up here, what's one key takeaway you hope our listeners walk away with today? What's the most important lesson about factor investing? If I had to boil down to one thing, I'd say it's this. Embrace the uncertainty. Factor investing, like all investing, it's a journey, not a destination, right? There will be times when you feel like you're riding high, and there will be times when you get knocked down. But as long as you have a solid grasp of those underlying principles and a well-diversified strategy, you'll be able to weather those storms and come out stronger on the other side. So it's about the long game, not the short-term wins and losses. Absolutely. And remember, the market is always evolving. Stay curious, keep exploring, and find what works best for you. There's no single right answer, but there are definitely a lot of wrong ones. Great point. So before we go, what's one thing you'd encourage our listeners to explore further based on what we've discussed today? I'd say dive deeper into the specific factors themselves. We've talked about size and value, but remember, there's a whole zoo out there. Each factor has its own nuances, its own quirks, and understanding those can help you make more informed decisions about how to actually incorporate them into your portfolio. It's like choosing which animals to visit at the zoo. Some might be more your style than others. And who knows, maybe you'll discover a hidden gem that nobody else is paying attention to. Exactly. That's the beauty of factor investing, right? It encourages you to think differently about the market to challenge those conventional wisdoms. This deep dive has been fantastic. I feel like we've just scratched the surface of this whole factor investing world. Thanks for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. And to all our listeners, thanks for tuning in. We hope you've gained a better understanding of how factor investing works, why it can be so unpredictable, and how you can potentially use it to boost your own investment outcomes. Until next time, happy investing.